In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we're going to do something new today. And that is, um, we'll start doing this each week. We're going to go over next Sunday's hymn of the day. So we can get that melody in our mind. If it's not familiar to us, we'll have a chance to hear it. So that we can sing with gusto in the sanctuary. So next Sunday is hymn 483, With High Delight, Let Us Unite. 483. My assumption is this is a familiar hymn. Oh. Sorry, I made the announcement earlier. I'll make it again. Grab a hymnal. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot to write it on the board. My fault. My mistake. The hands this morning were great. Were they? Yes. Beautiful. Good. We're okay. We don't need And the accompaniment was just spot on. Yeah, the first one was so Four, eight, three. <laughs> And at least for the summer, we will have our, our budding young church musician lead us in the singing of the hymns. 483, take it away, Olivia. I'm not kidding. <laughs>
Okay, um, you, the first, uh, the Sundays in uh, Advent, Sundays in Lent, Sundays in Easter, uh, have these Latin names that are affixed to them. Uh, and we used to publish them in the old hymnal, in TLH. You would, you would still find, you know, uh, Quasimodo Genini, Misericordius Domini, and, and such. They were there. Um, but the more recent hymnals have kind of gotten away from those older names. Next Sunday is Jubilate. Looks like the word jubilate. <coughs> so this is a fitting hymn, because right in the very first stanza we have, With high delight let us unite in songs of great jubilation. Right? So Jubilate, jubilate, jubilation Sunday. Okay, a quick uh, trivia question for you. <coughs> So the, uh, the last staff on the first page, um, the latter part of that middle uh, middle stanza, you see where it says, or death and grave? Or death and grave? What word comes next? There we go. Yeah. Seth. Uh, not sayeth. Sayeth is S-A-Y-E-T-H. This is Seth. Maybe you already knew that. So... Just, uh, I've heard people say sayeth a lot, and you know, two syllables over a single note. Anyway, Seth, poor death and grave, Seth E. who gave. Seth. Like the, like the male's name, Seth. Okay, thank you, Olivia. And now we've got, uh, are you familiar with next week's hymn of the day? If you, if you are a Congregation at Prayer user, um, the Congregation at Prayer with the weekly bulletin is a great, you know, they work well together for weekly devotions. Um, we have, um, and this one especially, this Sunday is, is, is also known as Good Shepherd Sunday. You probably noticed all the readings, the uh, Psalm 23 is even a psalm that's assigned for today. Uh, everything has a shepherd, you know, theme in it. Um, but if you do follow the congregation of prayer, when you come to the middle prayer, you know, where it says to insert names of family and friends and church members and so forth, the back of your bulletin is a good, a good resource for that, where you can find individuals who have requested prayer and uh, what they've requested, requested prayer for. Okay, let's dive in to 2 Kings. We're going to try to start and finish 2 Kings uh, today, start it and finish it next Sunday, because on the 19th we're going to recognize our graduates and promotees, and so we won't have any Sunday school that day, we're going to have a cake and a special celebration that we can you know, say happy graduation. <coughs> I think we have eight graduates here. Do we have any other graduates than Marissa Lane? Are there? David Bella. David Bella, that's right. And She graduated from Grand Canyon? No, praise the Lord. All right, well, we will, we will recognize all those folks. Uh, on the 19th. And then on the 26th, we're going to take a break from our trip through the Old Testament, and we're going to study something thematic together. So if you've read uh, the bullet or the newsletter most recently, we're going to take a look at um, the death of a Christian, how a Christian approaches death, um, how a Christian thinks about death, all the things surrounding it. Um, and also a look at uh, the funeral service that we use in the Lutheran Church. And we'll do that for, I don't know, I think four or five Sundays. So we've got these booklets called the Final Victory. Um, there's a few of them out in the back of the narthex today. Um, and they're available for anyone to grab. We're going to ask for a suggested donation of $8 per booklet. Um, anybody who can't you know, give eight bucks, please take them anyway, because these are important. So, we look forward to that in a few weeks. 
2 Kings. Okay, it's been a few weeks since we've made our way, since we've visited the Kings. What happened the last time? Where do we leave off? What happens at the end of first week? So the latter part of 1 Kings is really the, uh, the battle between Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel. So Ahab, um, there's the big showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal and Elijah. Um, Yahweh obviously wins, the prophets of Baal are put to death, and then it's just, now it's, you know, it's a tooth and nail fight between them. Between them. So Ahab meets his demise at the end of 1 Kings, and his son uh, reigns in his place. Jezebel survives for a while. So her horrific end is about to come uh, later on down the road. All right, so in chapter 1, I know I've got 2 Kings 1 through 5 on your sheets. Uh, hopefully everybody has one of these. Uh, I've only got notes for the first five chapters. We're going to try to at least talk through 6, 7, and 8. And, and break there, and then pick up with chapter 9 next Sunday, because chapter 9 is where we meet this guy named Jehu, and Jehu, we just it's a, we just enter the bloodbath. It's just an absolute monstrous, you know, I mean, he's just <coughs> putting people to death left and right, you know. Um, there was a, a punk band from the 90s, Drive Like Jehu, anybody heard of him? No? All right. I'll play some songs of theirs next Sunday when we start talking about Jehu. So, in 2 Kings chapter 1, Ahab's dead. Ahaziah is now the king in Samaria. And remember, Samaria is also known as Israel. And that's the northern kingdom. Okay? After Solomon died, the kingdom split in two. Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Israel's, Israel is also known as Samaria. So, you've got to keep these things straight as you read through kings because you got prophets sent to the north, and the prophets in the south, and then the kings in the north and the south. And the way that they've recorded this information is not the easiest to follow. Anyways, uh, the end of second, or the end of first kings there, chapter 22, verses 52 to 53, says, He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and we're talking about Ahaziah, uh, and walked in the way of his father, and in the mother, and the way of his mother, Jezebel. And in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. Okay, once again, what's the sin of Jeroboam? <coughs> what did he do specifically in the north? <coughs> Idolatry. He set up a another temple, another worship spot. Right, so he had a couple, you know, when it comes to time to embrace idols, the Israelites have a certain predilection for a, for a certain animal. It's always a calf. Right? Ah, let's make ourselves another golden calf. And so Jeroboam sets up a couple of golden calves and says, you don't need to go down to Jerusalem to worship. You can stay up here in the north. That's the sin of Jeroboam, by which he led people astray. Yeah. So what's the, the draw for the cow, the calf? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's big in the ancient world. Yeah, it's um, like the bull of heaven. And yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know exactly. I mean, I'm not prepared to give an answer. I can, I can hazard a guess. Um, but if you read when Aaron fashions a cow, right, or when Aaron says, uh, I threw this gold into the fire, how came this cow? Uh, which is just a delightful thing. Um, I think if you read closely to what he says to the people, you know, he says, tomorrow we're going to have a feast to the Lord. And literally in Hebrew, he said, we're going to have a feast to Yahweh. So I don't think that they're not, by erecting a golden calf, it's not, you know, it's not just another, it's not an Asherah pole, it's not something to Molech. I think they're looking, you know, and maybe this is, this is the time period, you know, this is just the, the ancient Near East. <clears throat> Um, there's the want a physical idol to see and to touch and to bow toward. And so Yahweh, has, for some reason, gets this cow. 
Because, like I said, when Aaron, when Aaron makes the cow, he says, tomorrow's going to be a feast to the Lord. <clears throat> L-O-R-D, capital letters, meaning Yahweh. So this golden calf is going to be used, you know, I think Aaron, what Aaron's trying to do is Aaron's trying to, you know, he's trying to be the, uh, I don't know, he's the peacemaker in all the wrong ways, right? He's trying to appease all different groups, like, you know, we've got, we got our Yahwists over here who want to worship the true God. we got our folks who like the golden calf. And it, there's no reason we can't put them together. Um, I mean, I, I don't have, I can't say anything more than that. I would have to do some, do some studying. So, but we just know that this is what they do. They make cows. And that's what Jeroboam did. And that phrase is, you know, when the, the sin of Jeroboam gets repeated a lot in Kings. The interesting thing about Kings is, uh, as you'll see in these first couple chapters, you go, really, you know, for a book known as Kings, we're spending more time learning about prophets than we are learning about kings. You know, and it's really the relationship of, of prophets and kings. You know, or, you know, the story of wicked kings... Wicked kings in the north, wicked kings in the south, and the prophet, the south, and the prophets that God sends to call them back to fidelity and orthodoxy. Um, okay, so Ahab's dead. Ahaziah is reigning, and right off the bat, we Ah Ahaziah, you know, falls through like some lattice work in, in upstairs somewhere and injures himself, and it's a it's a very serious injury, and uh, and you find. That when people get themselves, you know, the kings are all of a sudden afraid that their army is going to be defeated. Ahaziah falls and, you know, his death seems imminent. What they want to do is they want to go inquire of the Lord or the God to see if they're going to make it. What's going to happen? And so you'll see this a lot. Go, in, go inquire for me if, you know, I'm going to recover or not. So, um, so what Ahaziah does, because he's following in the ways of his father... He tells these messengers to go inquire of, and it literally says this, go inquire of Beelzebub. Right? I mean, the very God that Jesus gets accused of being in league with in the New Testament, right there in verse 2, um, Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick, so he sent messengers telling them, go inquire of Beelzebub. You think, how does it, how does it get to this point? How do you, you Israelites go to inquire of the Lord of the Flies, this false god? But God of Ekron, right? Go inquire of him. And so this, this particularly angers the Lord. And so the Lord sends message to Elijah, and he tells him, you know what? You need to go cut off those messengers on their way to inquire of the bells above and give them a message from me. And the message is, no, Ahaziah, you're not going to recover. So we get in verse 3. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal's above the God of Ekron? It's just kind of a, you know, it's one of those SMH moments, right? Shaking my head. Can't believe it. Um, so Elijah doesn't tell this in person to the king, Ahaziah. He says that this to the messengers that Ahaziah has sent. They go back to um, the king. And then Ahaziah goes, well, you know, I want Elijah to come and you know, speak with me personally. So he starts sending these groups of 50 to Elijah, who's up on a mountain somewhere. And I'm calling them platoons. So there's a couple of platoons that get sent. 50 soldiers and their captains. And the first two, the captains come up to where Elijah is and they say, come on down, right? We're ordering you, or by order of the king, you need to come. And, um, and Elijah says, where are you? Uh, <coughs> I think I'm just going to call the Lord to consume me with fire. And, and he does. So the first group of 50, along with the captain, goes up in flames. So then the king goes, well, let's send another group. So the second platoon comes, another group of 50 soldiers with their captain. Same thing. Come on, Elijah, come down. i got to go see the king. No, I think I'm going to consume me with fire. So I really think that, that James and John, the sons of thunder, um, they, they've got these stories in mind. You know, when they're with Jesus and they're encountering people who are, uh, who are giving Jesus trouble, you know, and they're like, 
You you know this familiar with the story? James and John, the sons of thunder, nicknamed, you know, Blanardies. They want to call down fire from heaven to, to, to take care of some people that are giving Jesus a tough time. And Jesus says, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I think they want to, they want to be, you know, they want to be Elijah's. And Elisha has his own moment. Elisha has his own moments like that, too. Anyways, a, a third platoon is sent. A third group of 50 soldiers with the captain. Although the captain this time takes a bit of a different approach. And he says, O oh, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of 50 men with their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. Okay? Different tactic. And the Lord then sends word through Elijah, or to Elijah, yeah, go with this guy. So all of this happens. What ends up, you know, what results of it is Elijah then goes, and he's in the presence of King Ahaziah, just to tell him the same thing that he told the messengers. You are going to die. So Ahaziah dies. And then Jehoram, who's another son of Ahab, so Jehoram would be Ahaziah's brother, because Ahaziah did not have any children or any sons, um, Jehoram becomes king. Okay? So we're, we're still in the northern kingdom. Okay? We haven't, nothing's going on. We don't know what's going on in Jerusalem. Well, we do, but we haven't, you know, chapter 1 hasn't told us anything about that yet. Judah, Jerusalem down to the south, they're doing their own thing. This is all... All of the north. So Elijah is a prophet in the northern kingdom. With chapter 2, we then encounter um, the details with Elijah's departure from this world. So there are a few people who, who didn't experience physical death in the Bible. Do we know who they are? Moses? No, Moses died. Moses died. But there are there's details around Moses' death though. That are sketchy. Yeah. We get this really strange comment in Jude, in the, in the little letter of Jude in the New Testament about um, uh, the archangel Michael and Satan fighting over the body of Moses. But you know, Moses died. But well, we got two guys who didn't die. Huh? So, uh, oh, Elijah. Elijah is one of them, right? Yeah, we're going to hear about that in just a minute. And somebody way before him, right? Enoch. Enoch, right? Way back in Genesis. Genesis 5, I think. So, before, Mo or before Noah. Yeah, Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more. Enoch walked with God. So he got to live to the to the right young age of 300 and some odd years old. And I think, who was it, Enoch's father was Methuselah? Or Enoch's son? Anyway, Methuselah is close to Enoch. And he's the oldest recorded uh, person. I think he's 969 years old. So, uh, anyways, a lot of... I heard that. <laughs> Elijah is about to be taken to heaven. Elisha is with him. He's kind of serving as his assistant. Um, Elijah is then, now he's, he's traveling about. And it seems to be like he's, he knows that his departure is imminent. And so he's on this kind of trip to say goodbye uh, to, to people. So he's starting from Gilgal. And I should have, next week I'll get a, a map up so we can see these places. The Gilgal, to Bethel, to Jericho, and then he finally winds up at the Jordan River where he crosses. And he tells, uh, he's trying to get rid of Elisha. He tells Elisha, um, you know, please stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. He's leaving Gilgal. And I don't know exactly off the top of my head how far Bethel is from Gilgal. Uh, but Elisha says, no, you can't get rid of me. As the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I won't leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And here, we encounter the phrase for the first time, the sons of the prophets at Bethel, which is also going to happen in Jericho and other places, and there's also one in Gilgal. We've got these sons of the prophets there. So, 
What are the sons of the prophets? Any idea? Are they friends or enemies? No, no. So, I mean, basically what they are are, uh, I mean, I guess we could call them seminaries, so to speak. They're schools. Yeah, they're schools uh, where the prophets are trying to, um, you know, to preach and teach and do all that sort of stuff. And so when they arrive in Bethel, you know, the sons of the prophets go to Elisha and they say, hey, you know that your master is uh, going to be leaving soon. And he's like, yeah, I know, shut up. Right? He doesn't want to deal with it. Um, he says something, uh, they translate it differently in here. When they say, it is, it's shut up, but, you know. Oh, he said, you know, verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. And he said, yes, I know, keep quiet. Right? We don't want to put shut up in the mouth of Elisha, do we? Oh, man, that's rude. That's what he says. So, happens again when they get to Jericho. The sons of the prophets are there, and they're like, you know, Elijah's taken off, right? Like, I know, be quiet. So then it's just Elijah and Elisha. They get to the Jordan River. Elisha, Elijah takes his cloak, slaps the river, the waters part, and they both go across. And now there's this moment where Elijah says, okay, um, before I leave, what would you like me to do for you? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah goes, well, that's a that's tall order. You know, I don't know if I can do it. But if you, if you see me departing, you know, caught up with the chariots of fire and the whirlwind as I go up into heaven, um, you know, then it will probably happen. And so he does. He sees it. Elijah has this, you know, freak out moment. My Lord. Um, what does he say? Yeah. My Father, my Father. You find the, the these prophets, especially these, maybe we can call them arch prophets, kind of the heads over the the, the sons of the prophets, these schools, are referred to as father. Uh, even the king will address Elisha in a later chapter as father. So Elisha sees Elijah go, tears his own clothes, picks up Elijah's cloak, goes back to the Jordan, slaps it with the cloak again, the waters part, Thus proving, or thus showing, okay, yes, Elisha is the true successor to Elijah, and he goes back. And now he's going to be interacting with people, um, and he's going to be kind of in charge of these sons of the prophets. Um, and they say, I'm at the bottom of that front page now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And then, things get weird. Things get really weird. Um, Elisha, things were weird with Elijah. I mean, these are they're strange guys. I would love to, to talk with Elijah and Elisha. I would have loved to Peter, James, and John to be up on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus talks with Moses and Elijah. I mean, what what a moment that would have been. But uh, uh, golly, so <laughs> when Elisha takes over, um, we got the, these a couple of strange things at the end of chapter two. So follow along with me, starting at verse nineteen, Second Kings two nineteen. Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation in this, in this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new bowl, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water, and threw salt in it, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. And then this part is fantastic. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city 
and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. That's one of my favorite passages. <laughs> You've been a teacher, haven't you? Why? Huh? Why? 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 Because <laughs> when I was oh. young and going ball, I had people come to tell me, you know you're going ball. You're losing your hair. Oh. <laughs> I tell them I know, but thank you for telling me. <laughs> not really, that's not really what I want to tell them. But, uh, yeah, you want to curse them in the name of the Lord and call out she bears. <laughs> Mama bears, right? So, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What did your Old Testament professor tell you about this? Um, we didn't cover this, actually. Seriously? Seriously. Okay. So it's just a weird part. There's a lot of gap in <coughs> seminary education. There's a lot of really good stuff. I mean, it, it's true. There's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of good introductory material, but you're really, you know, you got to fill in the gaps when you're out. you got to do your own study. So uh, we didn't go over kings uh, at all, other than just a kind of a cursory, you know, look at it. It's a good lesson for young people. Be nice. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, see what can happen to you. I know. I used it a lot. Right. Dress up as a bear in the middle of the night. Coming in your house. So yeah, we got a couple of these great stories here. Uh, like I said, things, things tend to get gruesome. When you start the section, you go like, you just think it's a couple of kids that are out on the street, and they're like, you know, hey, Baldy, or whatever. But then the bears come, and there's like 42 kids, and you go, wow, this is a this is a gang, you know, that Elisha encountered. So, yeah, he hits the ground running. All right, so that's chapter two. Chapter three, we continue on where we get word again that Moab um, is continuing to rebel against Israel. That was actually the very first thing uh, in verse 1 of the entire book of 2 Kings. Chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Okay, We kind of took a, we veered off course a little bit to learn about Ahaziah and then um, Elisha as Elijah's successor. But now we're coming back to Moab. Okay, So, in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria in the reign of 12 years. There we get again, this is where we get really confused. And um, I've got to make a note to remember myself. I need to give you a chart with the kings so you can see. But the way that the kings, are, their years or their reigns are dated is in relationship the northern king to the southern king and vice versa. Okay? So the northern king begins his reign at so many years of the reign of the southern king. And the southern king begins his reign so many years into the reign of the northern king. Okay? So, there is no, uh, there's no established, it began the reign in, you know, 1976 or whatever. It would be nice, but it's not there. But Moab comes back, right? So, we've heard of, we've, we've heard of Moab before. Uh, any famous folks from Moab? Ruth. Ruth, the Moabitess. Yeah. We have a Moabitess who then earns her, or, you know, not earns, that's a terrible thing. The Lutheran pastor is just using the word earns. Yikes. Whoa. That's worthy of being brought up, you know, charges. <laughs> Moabitess uh, is graciously <laughs> brought into the family tree of the Messiah. She's a grandmother, great-grandmother of David. So, David had uh, defeated Moab. In 2 Samuel 8, uh, we read, David defeated Moab and he measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. Two lines he measured to be put to death and one full line to be spared. And the Moab Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. Fast forward so many years, now Moab's rebelling, and they don't want to bring tribute. And the tribute that they're supposed to bring 
is there in the next bullet point. 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. Okay? So they're supposed, to, they're supposed to basically, you know, bring this tax uh, tribute to Israel every so often. I don't know if it's every year. I can't remember. But they say, no, we don't want to do it. Ahab's dead. You know, let's go to war. So Jehoram summons the king of the south, Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom to wage war against Moab. So they all muster together. They venture out into the desert. And then they kind of get lost wandering around in the desert. And they run out of water. So the northern king despairs. But the southern king speaks words of consolation. So let's pick it up in chapter 3, verse 9. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and when they had made a circuitous march of seven days, there was no water for the army or for the animals that followed them. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Then one of the king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom, went down to him. And Elijah, or Elisha said to the king of Israel, <clears throat> What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father, and to the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. And now this is strange, but now bring me a musician. Okay. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, Thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind or rain, but that stream bed shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink your livestock and your animals. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites into your hand, and you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree and stop up all springs of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. The next morning, about the time of offering the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom till the country was filled with water. So, taking a break right here, you see, you see a difference, first of all, in the reactions of the kings, you know, with the difficult situation that they get into. Um, Elisha obviously has regard for the king in the south. Uh, in the south, remember this is Judah. Je uh, Jerusalem is there, the city where God has put his name, right? And God has promised to be faithful to the city. Why? Because he made a promise to be faithful to the king of Judah. Yes, David. Right. So he's honoring the promise to this king, David. Jehoshaphat, you can see, is not despairing. He doesn't despair like Jehoram does. And he goes, all right, well, let's, you know, before we get carried away, you know, that we're all running out of water, let's go inquire the prophet. Um, you can see Elijah has no love for Jehoram, right? Why don't you go talk to your mom and dad's prophets, right? Go inquire of Baal's above again, right? If it weren't for Jehoshaphat here, I wouldn't give you the time of day. I wouldn't talk to you, wouldn't even look at you. But for his sake, I'll inquire the Lord for you. So the musician plays and he gets this um, he gets this word from the Lord that water is going to come and they are going to be victorious over Moab. And then you have this wonderful statement. This is a light thing for the Lord. This is a light thing for the Lord. You don't think you think that it's difficult for him to, to bring you water in a in a dry land? That's not hard for the Lord. You think it's difficult for him to give you victory over your enemies? This is a light thing for the Lord. And he's given them into your hands. Next morning, the offer of the sacrifice, and of course, then the water comes. 
Verse 21, when all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to put on armor from the youngest to the oldest were called out and were drawn up to the border. And when they rose early in the morning and the sun shone on the water, the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings have surely fought together and struck one another down. Now then, Moab, to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose and struck the Moabites till they fled before them. And they went forward, striking the Moabites as they went. And they overthrew the cities. And on, every, and on every good piece of land, every man threw a stone until it was covered. They stopped every spring of water and felled all the good trees till only its stones were left in Kir Haraseth. And the slingers surrounded and attacked it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. We need to take a moment here and try to understand this verse 27. Everything is going well. The Moabites are given into the hands of the Israel, of the king of Israel, and the other kings who are with him. Right? They're routing the enemy, felling all the trees, stopping up the springs, and things are at their most dire for Moab. And for that king, right? He makes one last effort to kind of take on the king of Edom. That doesn't go well. So he comes back and performs a human sacrifice. His own son on the wall. So what are we to gather this? This was supposed to be this was a public plain view in front of everyone, right? That he would do this. This was actually, a, this is a fairly common thing that took place in the ancient world human sacrifices um, in very dire circumstances. Uh, I remember reading about um, in ancient Greece, you know, you'd have these these small groups of uh, city-states, you know, living in these little islands. Um, and then here would be, here would come the ships of whatever, you know, the big navies coming to, to defeat, you know, the, and this little island, and so the king orders, you know, ten virgins to be taken up to the temple, you know, and sacrificed. It's this last-ditch effort to, right, to placate the gods. I'm surprised the prophets of Baal didn't do that on the top of Mount Carmel. Um, they, but they cut themselves, right, because these gods love blood. Um, it's what moves them to act. So this is what takes place. Now, verse 27 again. And he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, right? So we're taking the heir to the throne. And offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. Right? So probably what happened is he had his throat slit, his blood poured out, and then his body, you know, put on top of a pyre and lit on fire. Right? So it creates this huge scene. And there came great wrath against Israel. How do we make sense of that? Why does there come great wrath against Israel? And, and whose wrath is it? <clears throat> well, I don't think it makes any sense to think that this is... God has already promised to give... Moab into the hand of the Israelites. So it's not the wrath of God come against Israel. That makes no sense. So whose wrath is it? This is a difficult passage. And there's a lot of differing opinions on this passage. But I'm going to give you my take on it. My take is that um, have you ever, I mean, 
when some, somebody is at the point of death, okay, uh, there is usually there's a there's a a fight for all with all your might at the very end, okay. Like if the body is if you're drowning and you're out of air, the body flails wildly, right, until there's nothing left, until it, there's just still. Um, if you cut the head off a chicken, right? <coughs> At least I've heard. I've never actually seen it. We've got some chicken farmers. Did they run around? I don't know. Never cut one off. I was for sure you would have cut one off. Yeah, so if you crush the head of a snake, I do have, a, I do have experience chopping the head off a snake, as a matter of fact. So I pinned a snake to the ground one time and uh, was just cutting its head off. And the whole body was just going, you know, crazy, right? It's flailing about. So I think this is what, what's happening is that Moab knows that they're, they're at the point of total wipeout, okay? And they see the king sacrifice his own son, and this sends the Moabites, the remaining Moabite army, to just give it all they got to Israel. And I take this last sentence, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. That's the armies of Israel and Judah and Edom withdrawing. They shouldn't have done that. It's like they got scared off at this you know, fierce display um, from Moab at the point of its you know, being, over, being conquered. Um, because the Lord had promised... Moab to be you know, given into their hand. So, um, that's my take on this. The king sacrifices his son, and then the faithful remaining Moabite soldiers <clears throat> then are inspired to just give it all they got. Okay? And that's fine. They can give it all they got. They're expected to give it all they got. Fight, you know, to the very death. But that doesn't mean that Israel should have withdrawn. You know, they should have pressed on further because the Lord had given them into their hand. So, don't know that any of you have ever given, you know, this passage much thought, but if anybody wants to counter, have another opinion, have you read anything else about this? So, like I said, there's a variety of opinions. There are some theologians who, for whatever reason, think that One of the things I did read was that um, God is, was holding Israel accountable for pressing Moab to that point. To the point where the king would offer his son as a sacrifice. And then, and, and then God then directs his wrath toward Israel. As in, as in, you went too far, you pushed him too hard, you know, I didn't want him to go that way. That doesn't jive with what God had promised Israel beforehand, Right? You're going to, right, every fortified city, every tree, every spring, you know, this is, this is like God, you know, with the Israelites entering the promised land, you know, wipe them out. And here we see, we're given a reminder of why God wants these countries devoted to destruction. Because what he promises Abraham, all the way back in Genesis 15, as he says, you know, so many hundreds of years are going to go by, right? My, my people are going to go down into Egypt. They're going to be there 430 years before I bring them out. That's because I'm waiting for the, the fullness, you know, of the wickedness of the Ammonites. You know, these one of these Canaanite tribes. I'm waiting for their wickedness to reach its fullness. And then when it does, I'm going to bring my people out of Egypt. And they will be my instruments to go and cleanse this land. And that's the land that they will inhabit. And we know that Israel isn't totally faithful in wiping out these Canaanites. Um, because this is the, the sort of detestable practice that they have, that the Lord says, this needs to be wiped from the face of the earth. Right? Human sacrifice, an abomination. Absolute abomination. All right, well, that brings us to the end of chapter 3. 
we get back to Elisha in chapter 4, um, and we start seeing some uh, similarities between Elisha and Elijah. Elisha comes across this widow. She's wealthy. She lives in Shunem. And um, she's apparently a stop along you know, one of his uh, treks that he makes on a regular basis. And she says, you know what we should do? You know, let's, uh, let's invite him to stay with us, and uh, we'll even put an extra room in our house for him to come stay as a guest, you know, during his travels. So he, he develops this relationship with this widow and her husband. Um, and there's a, uh, oh, no, no, wait, wait. Sorry, I, I'm ahead of myself. I'm ahead of myself. Um, that's after uh, Elisha helps out a widow whose husband was one of the sons of the prophets. He was like a, I don't know, let's call him a seminary student, maybe. Um, he dies, and she's now left with all this debt, and uh, the creditors come a-calling. And so Elisha then says, uh, you know what, let's start filling a bunch of jars with oil. And so jar after jar after jar is filled with this oil, you know, miraculously, and he goes, now you go sell the oil and pay off your debts. Okay? Reminds us of the story of the widow of Zarephath with Elijah, Remember, she's got this tiny amount of oil and flour left, and they just keep taking from it and taking from it, and it just keeps miraculously multiplying. After that is when Elisha meets this wealthy woman and her husband in Shunem, and they make a casita for him. It doesn't say casita in Hebrew. Um, that's my own. I put that in there myself. In case you didn't know. So, yeah, they make a little mother-in-law order for him so that he can stay with him on his journeys. And then uh, he asks her. He's got, a, he's got a servant with him, a guy by the name of Gehazi, that we will get to know in the next chapter pretty well. Um, anyway, so Elisha says, you know, hey, what can we do for you? And she's like, ah, I don't know. And Elisha says, you know what, in about a year, you're going to have a son. And she goes, oh, come on. My husband's old. You know, I'm not going to have a kid. Well, sure enough. This is this is one of the Lord's favorite things to do, I think. Is to say, you're going to have a child when you're old. You know, we're, oh, come on. And then the Lord says, here you go. Here's your child. And then tragedy uh, strikes. Several years later, the child is older. We don't know how old, but uh, he gets sick. He goes outside. He's, he's helping his dad in the field and Begins to complain, you know, of a headache, my head, my head. He goes back in. Mom puts him in the guest room, and he ends up dying. And so she places him on the on the bed, leaves him on the bed there. She saddles a donkey, and she's going to go in search of Elisha. And her husband says, you know, hey, what's up? Where are you going? Or no, she says, you know, hey, it's not not that time. You know, I'm, or she says, I'm going to go for uh, that man of God. What? It's not that time of year that he normally comes about this way. And she says, hey. All is well. Right? So she has concealed the death of her son from her husband for whatever reason. She finds Elisha, and initially, Elisha sends his servant Gehazi to interact with her, um, but she doesn't let on like anything's a problem. She says, oh, no, everything's okay. And she finally comes into Elisha's presence, and then she just loses it. She falls down, and she said, You know, my son is dead. You know, what is going on? You know, can you please come and help me? Elisha goes back. Um, and there's some, you know, does a similar, uh, he ends up, you know, raising her son from the dead. There's some similar stuff that Elijah does when the widow of uh, Zarephath's son dies. Uh, but with this raising of the dead, uh, Elisha goes up, or he goes into the guest room and sees the child in the bed, lays on the child, and then... Uh, when the child is, you know, coming back to life, he sits up, sneezes seven times. That's in there. Um, and then he's okay. And Elisha gives him back to his mother. Um, See, so we're, we're seeing these uh, similarities between Elisha and Elijah. But there's several instances where Elisha is going to do more than Elijah did. Uh, and that is the evidence of his, the double portion of the spirit that he had asked for. <clears throat> All right. Then we got some other stuff at the end of chapter 4. 
He's eating with the sons of the prophets, makes some stew, and they go, oh my gosh, the stew is terrible. And uh, he's like, oh wait, just give me the flour, throw some flour in it, that, that takes care of it. The stew's good again. Um, and there is even a multiplication of some bread um, with leftovers, foreshadowing you know, our Lord's uh, multiplying of the bread uh, in the wilderness with the 4,000 and the 5,000. Chapter 5, we come up to good old Naaman, commander of the army of Syria. This is probably a familiar story, right? Let's see if we can... What happened with Naaman? Who's, who's Naaman? What's going on with him? You can read the sheet. He's the commander of the army of Syria. There we go. And why has he come to Elisha? For Comes for healing. Because he's a... Leper. Leper, right. How does Naaman even know to come to Elisha for healing? <clears throat> right. So he's he's a higher up. I mean, he's a super high up official uh, in the kingdom of Syria. And on one of their raids in Israel, because you know, we're, we haven't, you know, Syria is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to give Israel problems. Anyways, one of their raids, they they took back with them a, a young Israelite girl. And she was put to work in the house. She was basically given to be a mistress to Naaman's wife. And so she says to her mistress, or I'm using the words interchangeably. Anyways, she says to Naaman's wife, this slave girl, Oh, that my master would go and you know, see the prophet in Israel. That he would present himself because he'd be able to heal him. And so Naaman's got to be uh, at his, he's probably exhausted every possible avenue um, for healing for himself and his own land and so he thinks you know, he presents this to the king of Syria, the king says go for it and so he journeys with his retinue uh, over to Israel to meet Elisha, right? And so, how does Elisha greet Naaman? Well, does he meet him in person? How does he greet him? Does he does does Elisha go out and meet Naaman in person? No. Right. <laughs> Right? So again, he sends a message by his son. And what is Naaman instructed to do? Right, go wash in the Jordan. Now, I don't know, anybody been to Israel here? Yeah? So, so what, can you describe the Jordan River at all? Not very good. you want to describe it? Go for it. It's not very clear. Okay, this, there we go. I won't do that again. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's not known for being very clean. Um, and so Naaman is like, what? Go, go wash in the Jordan? You know, uh, we've got the, what is it? The, he's like, we've got these other rivers up in Syria. They're much better. Um. Pick it up at verse 10 in chapter 5. Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, that is Naaman, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them to be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? 
Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I don't know the last time when you held a baby, but babies have great skin. I mean, touching the, the skin of a little baby is uh, just a joyous, joyful thing. <clears throat> And so, there's a lot for us to take away, and I think this is all that we're going to get to uh, today, from this passage. Luther will talk about the, pro the precious gift that we have in baptism, and he will say, if the Lord told you, in, you know, in teaching about baptism, he'll say, if the Lord told you, he, he gave you this straw, and he said, you know what, pick up this piece of straw, and you will have tremendous blessings. Would anything prevent you from picking up the straw and treasuring the straw and holding it as a prized possession, you know, your whole life? Well, that's what God has given you in baptism. Um, there's much baptismal uh, imagery in this episode here with Naaman, right? Naaman despises the word of the Lord. Um, people despise baptism um, by thinking... You know, like, oh, what's the big, you know, what's the big deal? Like, why do I have to do it? I believe, right? Isn't that enough? Well, if the Lord had said anything to the effect of, you know, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, I don't think the Lord actually said that, but I think He did. Of course, He said that. Mark chapter sixteen: Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Right? Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Why would anybody not? Why would anybody refuse this gracious gift that God has given to His church? Why would we not hold it in such a prized possession? Um, so Naaman has to be rebuked for his dis despisal of God's word, because this is God's direction. This is God's way of healing Naaman. Naaman, we're, we're so much like Naaman, right? Like, do that. Wouldn't it be so much better to do it this way, right? Um, aren't the waters, you know, in Damascus so much better than this Jordan? But the Lord has told you, wash in the Jordan, right? And so... True wisdom is submitting to God and His Word, even when things don't quite make sense to us, but we think that there might be a better way to do things. So praise God for Naaman's servants who said, Now I don't know about you, but if I were a leper and someone told me to go jump in this river, I'd do it. I'd do it in a heartbeat. And so he relaxed. All right, so next week we'll have to pick up and see what now happens to Naaman after his cleansing. So, all right. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.